Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are and in the globe. Uh, thank you very much for joining us at the fifth African Philanthropy Conference here in the Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe, uh, the Majestic Falls. Uh, have you been to the falls, Prof? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. A wonderful falls, huh? Yeah. Uh, I've been on the Zambian side, uh, as I earlier said, uh, uh, that uh, when I studied history when I was young, yes, uh, the colonial history told me that uh, uh, Livingston discovered <laughs> the, the falls. The, the, the falls. Yeah. And as if there was no people living there knowing the falls. So that's who actually the, uh, took the, who, who, who took him <laughs> to the falls? Yeah, that's arrogance of colonialism. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll get into that. So we've got a special guest here, somebody that uh, actually knows what they're talking about, and that's our Professor Radebe, uh, who's from the Wits Business School. And we find you here. Prof, tell us, why do we find you here at the African Philanthropy Conference? Thank you very much, uh, Tinashe, to be on your Friday drinks uh, platform. It's a wonderful platform. Uh, you're mm -hmm. doing a great job. Um, the reason I am here is because uh, uh, at Virts Business School, we house CAPSI, which is Center for Advancement of Philanthropy and Social Investment, headed by Professor Beggy Moyo which has been very instrumental in arranging this conference. And as a, a leader of the business school, um, I am here because I support the whole philanthropy movement and uh, the Center for Entrepreneurship, uh, the Center for uh, Philanthropy uh, based at the business school is so important uh, in terms of educating the future business leaders uh, so that they understand philanthropy, not as a sideshow, not as a PR exercise, but at the center of the strategic uh, imperative of uh, any initiative they're involved in, whether it's business, NGO, or entrepreneurship. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so maybe let's start here. From a philosophical perspective, what are your views on philanthropy? Yeah. My, let me explain my views on philanthropy uh, mm. in, a, in an analogy of a fishing uh, storyline. Mm. Um, Philanthropy is a continuum which we must all understand. First, it starts with addressing poverty. So poverty, what does it mean? It means hunger. So if you come to me and you ask me for a fish, uh, if I give you a fish, which I should give you a fish if you're about to die because you're so hungry and that uh, you can't live another day, I have to give you a fish. Uh, it, that's what, but I'm going to feed you for one day. And that's very important. So that's one part of philanthropy. It's important that we accept that there are people who we need to give fish very quickly because if they don't, they're going to die of die. hunger mm. and starvation. Uh, so philanthropy, in that, that's almost the, the first line of defense of philanthropy. And now following this narrative uh, uh, analogy of a fish, but after you have uh, uh, eaten, the most important thing is that I should not give you a fish all the time because I'm going to have to give you a fish every day. So I've got to teach you how to fish. That is developmental side of uh, 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 the philanthropy. The first one where I give you a fish is what we call relief uh, okay. of uh, um, uh, uh, philanthropy. So the development means I need to give you the skills, I need to give you education, I need you to, to help you to be able to go and fish for yourself. Because when I do that, uh, in terms of philosophy of philanthropy, I'm going to feed you for life. You don't mm -hmm. need to come back. You don't need to depend. That's where we remove the dependency syndrome, which has bedeviled the whole of African uh, 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 continent, where a lot of uh, uh, philanthropy, whether it was faith-based, for instance, the missionaries, they created mm -hmm. a huge dependency syndrome. So I need to equip you to be able to really uh, catch a fish for yourself. Mm. The third level of philanthropy is once you know how to fish, I need to help you, empower you by helping you to get a rod or a, a net uh, or a boat to go out to fish. Because if you don't have the resources to go and fish, even if you know how to fish, you're still going to starve. Mm. And so the element of philanthropy that is required here is empowerment. Mm. The empowerment in terms of ensuring that people have access to resources 
and be able to be able to, to so that they can go out and fish. Then the fourth level of philanthropy, which I see is critical now, and it's been critical for a long time, is now you can fish, now you know how to fish, now you've got a rod to go and fish, but you go to fishing pond, and when you arrive there, there's a gate written, and this is the fence around the fishing pond, and the right of fishing is reserved for certain people, or certain class, or mm -hmm. certain uh, uh, sexual orientation, gender, or, or there's certain people who are on that. Others are excluded. Then the philanthropy needs to take the, the posture of social justice, in other words, mm -hmm. advocacy. Uh, in terms of making sure that you remove the right of reserve, uh, uh, right of entrance at the, at, the, at the fishing point. So in that way, then that's where you're talking about social justice, you're talking about uh, uh, human rights, you're talking about uh, all forms of uh, removing all forms of oppression. Uh, and, and that to me is, is the whole continuum of philanthropy. Uh, where people are here in this conference, they all play in this continuum that I've described right now. Mm -hmm. And we're gathered here together to really sharpen each other's thinking uh, and, and, and basically making sure that we understand and analyze the problems and be able to develop tools and, 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 and solutions to the problems. Okay, uh, so, so I've understood it uh, from a philosophical perspective. Now, let's bring it to maybe practical perspective on what does it mean for someone who's a business person, someone who is sitting in Africa, has made a bit of money, and their view of philanthropy, because now you've given them the, the continuum, they've now understood it, what do they do? What's the next step that they can do? That's a very, very important question, because, in fact, I want to actually, from, from an African philosophy, philanthropy point of view, we need to be very clear that is the Eurocentric philanthropy uh, perspective is that you, 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 you make money first and then when you've made money, then you come and donate money in a form of a becoming a donor, a philanthropy, and the big business leaders in the world have been doing that. Mm -hmm. in Af so you, 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 you pay it backwards. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Yes. You're paying backwards. In Africa, our philanthropy, you pay it forward. Mm. As you grow, you start being philanthropic through volunteerism. You start helping your siblings that come after you. I'm a firstborn at home. Mm. I've got four siblings. At some point in my life, I had to really stop continuing with my study, but actually starting paying go and work and pay for the fees of my siblings, all, all, all of them, because uh, our parents could not afford it. So that's, well, we need to start there, that philanthropy is ingrained in our understanding. Paying forward means as you grow, you continue to look at people that uh, you lift as you rise. Uh, and at the end, when you have made money, uh, or you've got the skill, or you've got the time, or you've got the energy, you can be able to apply it, apply it back into developing the next generation of leaders. Mm. So that, that, that to me is a better understanding of philosophy. Because if we just define it as aid coming from the Western world, uh, mm. that come to rescue us from poverty and, uh, or disaster, or the typical uh, pictures we see of a child, child uh, in every airport or in plane who's, uh, who's uh, hungry and, uh, and uh, 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 with a big tummy and a big head and the flies <laughs> flying over. The, I hate those pictures. You know, it's almost like they're orchestrated. I mean, how, yeah, yeah. you know, if, if you see a fly coming on your ears or eyes, you I should help you to do that. <laughs> Remove it. True, but true. That's, that's the Eurocentric uh, or, or let's say global north kind of mm. perception of, of philanthropy. Ours mm. is, you are because I am Ubuntu. Okay, from the Ubuntu perspective. Okay, so 
how you're changing my mind and I want us to then walk through with that train of thought is the African philanthropy is need-based. So what you're saying to me is where I am at the present moment, I must look for the need and yeah. immediately engage the need because that's how we've always done it. Yeah. And you gave you an example of yourself where your immediate need were your brothers and sisters yeah. as a firstborn. You're like, okay, I've started making a bit of money. I don't need to have millions yeah. because the need yeah. is direct. I can see the need yeah. and I need to be involved. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, in colloquialism or in nomenclature, that is sort of known as the black tax. And, or, and, 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 and you know, the, the minute you say black tax, and the minute you say it's philanthropy, it has different meaning, yeah. right? Yeah. I should never look at it as a tax. Yeah. I should look at it as, so in Western society, they're going to look at it as, oh, no, that's being philanthropic, right? And it's actually tax deductible, yeah. right? Yeah. And then when I'm in Africa, it's looked as, okay, you have to do this, and it's a tax. And I want you now to bring it back again to us so that we can connect these thoughts so that it's, it's livable for somebody like me who's actually in Africa. Yeah. It's very unfortunate that this term, black tax, emerged in the vocabulary of our, particularly our young uh, people, uh, uh, Gen Z or even before that. Uh, it's very unfortunate because I really think it, it has done more harm than good. Um, mm. in, uh, in, in a sense that it removed the responsibility that you develop as a young person if you start helping and supporting and encouraging and lifting the community in which you come from. It takes a village to take a young person to the, a university. It takes, and for you to come back with a mindset and say it's a black tax, when your mom, your dad, your grandparents, your, 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 your uncles have collected this money and helped you to go to university. And there's a sense of ungratefulness, if mm. I were to use that. Mm. And, and, and I, I actually don't like the term black tax. We should remove it from our vocabulary because it's a negative thing. Mm. There is so much you gain in giving uh, as a person and the sense of responsibility you get. In fact, uh, uh, you know, that's why even in biblical terms, it is, it, it, you're blessed when you it's give. It's better to give than to receive. Than yeah. receive. And, uh, and, and, and this whole idea of a black tax is a construct which I think we should discourage. As far as I'm concerned, I discourage every time I hear people, uh, young people talk about it. I, mm. I ask them, nobody's self-made. You are where you are because somebody sacrificed. And it's your turn to sacrifice. In fact, you are planting the seeds of your own success and growth and development because the people you're helping, you never know. They will be helping you tomorrow. And, and I've, been, uh, long, I've lived long enough that right now, the people that actually bring so much help to me is the people I helped and mentored when mm. I was young. Mm. And, uh, and, and they've never forgotten that. So, Prof, you're locating the problem as generational. That the problem is at some point between uh, your generation, uh, uh, baby boomers, yes, <laughs> I assume. Baby boomers, yes, definitely. <laughs> uh, and when we then locate uh, the millennials and Gen Z, at some point, it moved from actually helping yeah. a need to becoming a tax, and you think it's generational. Would you like to just unpack that for us? I, I, I think it's, it's generational because I have uh, seen it with my own kids. My kids are in their, in their late 20s and their 30s now. So mm. I work very hard to ensure that I'm giving them the best quality of life. Uh, and because they somehow did not see the levels of poverty from which we grew up as baby boomers, um, they, and I'm 
running a risk of alienating a lot of baby boomers that listen to your podcast here. <laughs> they want to say, where do you get that, man? <laughs> well, that's why we have this show. It's to really poke at uh, a lot of these uh, constructs. But I look at my kids. They grew up uh, in a house with electricity. They want Wi-Fi. They grew up with everything. They went to good schools. They... They, 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 they were able to have a car and drive, you know. I had to struggle to buy my own car. Mm. I had to save. So in a way, we have created um, young people who do not appreciate what it takes to actually do it. You know, they say it's tough times. As I said, press tough times, create tough people. people. And then tough, tough people, people, you say it. Create uh, tough, tough. People. Yeah, no, the, the tough times create tough people, people, which is us, the baby boomers. Uh -huh. And then tough people create real soft uh, people because they create an environment that is not tough. Mm. And then the product of that becomes people who are to a very large extent, I would venture to say selfish. Okay. So instead we're a product of our circumstances. Yeah, instead of being selfless. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, so what I hear is millennials, Gen Z are entitled. Sense of entitlement, completely believe that every the world owes them something and the world owes you nothing. Okay. So bringing it back to Africa, this is post-independence. So this is the generation that grew up with you know, uh, the barriers, the, the construct of colonialism had been broken. Yeah. And their fathers, their baby boomers had done well. And they've grown up in this entitlement and find it very difficult that now they have this tax. So that's why they call it a, a black tax. So what can we do? What are the practical steps that we can do? And having this conversation to start, but what do we need to do to actually deconstruct this notion of black tax so that they can see it? that actually it's not a tax, uh, it's something that you're doing for your community because that's how we've always been and that's the Ubuntu. Yeah. I think we, uh, the baby boomers, need to think very carefully how we provide for our kids. I think okay. we were compensating for what we lacked. Mm. Uh, we didn't have toys. <laughs> so, you bought, <laughs> so you bought your cheese or any toy they want including the games, and they sit mm. on the couch for all the whole year. <laughs> so we need to be, as parents, be very, very intentional about um, what we teach our kids. We have to expose them. One, one of the things that I actually was very intentional with my kids mm. is uh, almost every holiday I took them back to the rural areas. Okay. Where I remember in particular, now it has changed, but it was... The toilet was a long drop toilet. Because <laughs> they had a toilet in the house. But I went to my, my rural areas in my, my, my own... To experience the poverty. Yes, and they stayed there for at least a week after that. They phoned me and said, I said, you stay. <laughs> so you wake up at night, you go out. And you go. So we need to be intentional. I mean, and I'm using this, example, but intentional to expose them to the levels of poverty that is, that is still existing in our continent. Mm. So we need to really make sure that things like field trips, things like making sure that they go out there and save communities, they go to the poorest of the poor and become join NGO. That's why I love, love NGOs. To go and work in an NGO that is really dealing with whatever levels of uh, social ill that we have. And then be able that they are, that they are exposed to that. Because once mm. they are exposed to that, you realize that you just start begin to appreciate Okay. But also, what you should do is uh, we should be very intentional about uh, making sure that they work on a, on a voluntary basis in these in this, in this non-governmental organizations okay. so that they can be able to see that giving is part of life. All right. Okay. And, uh, and I think we need to be very intentional about that. All right. So now I'm going to support the millennials and the Gen Z because I want you, as part of your advocacy, to now go into government and speak to government policy. Uh, so part of the, if I were in a Western city and I were to give to charity, it's tax deductible. 
Okay. Whereas if I'm in Africa and I were to give to charity, it's the government policy is not clear there. Right? How do we ensure that government policy recognizes that whenever I give, it should be tax deductible? Because that's also part of the change in mindset. If Gen Z and millennials knew that government policy says if you were to give, you were to donate, that is tax deductible. Oh no, definitely. I mean, I uh, in and I don't, I can't speak of other countries, but in South Africa, we've got uh, a very clear legislation. Uh, particularly, particularly if you're giving to um, education, we've got Section 18A. Uh, tax uh, uh, relief that you can uh, uh, claim back mm -hmm. and uh, also if you give uh, to the NGOs as long as, as long as you can be very clear it's a it's an NGO that is credible and it's an NGO that is got uh, also properly registered you will get tax uh, deduction so what what you're saying we just need to make sure that people are aware of it we yeah. increase the awareness of that but also make it practical because, because my need, if I'm giving to beyond just my family yeah. and I'm giving to my cousins because that's where the need is, yeah. that should also be deductible. Yeah. Uh, in Western societies, they don't look at it like that because probably the state is actually providing the welfare. Yeah. But here the need is I've got relatives in the rural areas yeah. uh, and if I'm giving them, yeah. surely that should also be tax deductible because now it's I relevant think, to my environment absolutely i think you're right there i think we need to construct that uh, policy framework uh, mm. that will take into consideration that and i think it's a very good idea a podcast like this one should uh, yeah. uh, get a team of smart uh, gen z and millennium lawyers uh, together and form a task team now how legislation is formed you get a task team of smart people uh, and then you can craft it and then uh, put it as a proposal. I, I love this, Prof, because you are extremely progressive. Now, let's move away from that and let's again focus on the African philanthropist, right? So we've got the, well, well, before we get to African philanthropist, let's talk about the people who are actually donating to Africa, which are mostly Western uh, people. Uh, let's, the current model, do you see it working and how can we improve the current model? The current model is, is no longer working. In fact, uh, 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 this whole idea of the global north developing uh, the whole framework of philanthropy by uh, deciding who to give, how to give, the criteria, and all those kinds of things, and it's a, it's it's and, and it creates huge dependency. It uh, it actually make. Uh, the, the communities in which you operate uh, so dependent that they're actually not empowered to develop themselves. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that we must reject. That we must change. That we must... We can't afford to have that model. We need to have our own uh, philanthropy, uh, which is about starting with the community. And the sole aim of that is to empower the communities to be able to take care of their own needs. And it must start with the needs of the community, but also the solutions must come from the community mm. so that they are sustainable. This thing of parachuting into the community and says, what do you need? You don't actually let me, you know, if I need your opinion, I, 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 let me give you my, your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. And, you know, Fair enough. And then you just uh, bring in a, a technology or tractor or whatever they need and then after you leave there people can't even fix it can't even do it and then it's just, it's it stays there and it does it just can't work like that. you've got to change that okay fair enough and now i'm going to attack again the baby boomers yeah uh, and especially in south africa right uh these are the people who benefited post uh apartheid yeah. uh these are people who benefited from be Right, yeah, and yeah. these are people who grew up in the rural areas, like yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, these are people who understand the poverty levels in Africa or in South Africa. They've benefited, yeah. right? And now they're known as entrepreneurs. They're now billionaires, millionaires in run terms, and also in US dollar terms. But if you, they're now well known or more known for dating Gen Z and millennials than they are for actually doing and changing uh, society. 
Yeah. What's the problem there? Because they've benefited. They are now wealthy, but we don't see them you know, at a conference like this. We don't see the work that they're doing as far as philanthropy is concerned. We see them buying a lot of cars. We see them dating Gen Z, so corrupting the moral fiber of our society. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, it's terrible. It's evil. And uh, it must be condemned. Uh, and I condemn it publicly because mm -hmm. I'm part of that generation that benefited from, uh, I call it black business rather than BBE. B because okay. black people actually have been very entrepreneurial. Actually, there's more entrepreneurial people in, 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 in South Africa. Um, when apartheid was its height, the entrepreneurial spirit was very, very high. Mm. It's sad, actually. Well, if you do a study, you can see the entrepreneurial spirit is going down. Mm. But black business, I'm proud of black business. We started a business, we grew it, and then we, we, we sold it to a big multinational. And the, and the, and the, and but I know I've got my friends and colleagues that we grew up with, and, uh, and we're doing that. We must mm. condemn it. That's what they call the blessers in South Africa. Mm. That's evil. That's evil. And uh, um, because it destroyed the moral fibers of those young people, and uh, you actually a predator. In fact, uh, uh, we should be able to, as if there was a law, we should we should arrest this kind of people. <laughs> 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 but they'll say, well, the child, the, the, the girl is 18 years old, so it was consensual. Mm. But that's not consensual because you entice, you actually uh, uh, pre you're a predator. You're just mm. a predator. And uh, and and uh, and that's a that's a bad side of of wealth that we've seen uh, amongst us as baby boomers uh, happening, particularly even in South Africa. But it's not everyone like that. It's just mm. they get a lot of visibility because social media. Uh, in fact, even those young uh, uh, people like to. When they they're flexing, they, yeah, yeah, those are the ones that we see. You see them on social media, and they, when a blesser has come, uh, and then it's taking them to a nice hotel like this one, uh, and then they post, <laughs> <laughs> and we follow the money, and we find it's uh, a entrepreneur. Yes, and, uh, and 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 it's it's not all of them are like that. Okay. Not all of them, I can tell you that. Uh, there's a lot of us there in South Africa who are condemning this. We're condemning the, and there's a lot of us who are actually says this is this is this is totally unacceptable, and the, and and the, but we need to sh just call them out. It's as simple as that. Call them out, name and shame, and 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 so that we get rid of this very 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 bad tenants. Mm. And 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 I, I I I have no sympathy for those people who are called out, especially when they are found out, and then they are, because what it does is that it destroys their marriages. Mm. Uh, and then it embarrasses their kids who are already mm. also you know in their 20s and 30s it's it's just it's a mess you know? so you're saying they they do have a moral obligation maybe that's how we should speak that yeah. they do have a moral obligation if you look at uh the western societies beyond a certain level of wealth you do have a moral obligation towards your society obviously i mean it's it's, it's, uh, there is no doubt in my mind that to whom that is given, more is expected. More is expected. It's just a fun, it's a value system that you need to need. Mm. And you are expected that you need to help because you can, and help does not come just from a monetary way. Help comes from when I was young, as soon as I did maths and physics. As soon mm. as I passed my degree in maths and physics, I was teaching maths and physics matriculants. To those in the community. Yeah, yeah. and I'd organize tutorials, I'd organize those kinds of things. And, and just sharing maths because maths was just demystifying mathematics, you know. Mm. And that to me is, is, is what philanthropy is about. Okay. And, uh, and this pre what you talked about uh, of BE guys or entrepreneurs that uh, uh, they, those are called predators. They okay. will just be locked in jail. In fact, All right. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you've, uh, you've articulated it very well, Prof. Well, I suppose that's why you're a professor. <laughs> right? uh, now, let's get to a lot of the work that African philanthropists are doing. So, in Zimbabwe, one of uh, 
one who's particularly done a lot of work is Stripe Monsieur. Stripe, yes. yeah. Yeah, Stripe has Great done, man. yeah, fantastic. I mean, uh, yeah. he's a higher life, uh, higher learning, uh, yeah. a higher life. Uh, they've done quite a bit in terms of education. Uh, they've done a bit in terms of healthcare uh, and, you know, orphans whose parents baby boomers died of uh, HIV AIDS and then they've helped the millennials and we've seen the work that has transcended into a generation that is actually educated and has gone on to the US and everywhere else but it feels very strongly that he's doing it in a silo it's him and his initiator with his family right uh, how is it or how can we get all the African successful business people across the border from a pan-African perspective, how can we, how can we organize them so that they really tackle Africa's problems? First, let's say we're very, very grateful to Strive because Strive has really been a shining example of what philanthropy is, uh, black philanthropy is, and uh, and we must be very thankful uh, to him and his family. But I, I need to. Dis- just correct you a little bit. He's not doing it only in just in the silos. The Strive mm. is a very, particularly uh, his family. Um, there's a very strong relationship between Strive and Capsi, mm. uh, uh, which is uh, basically almost in most of these conferences, uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Masiwa. Masiwa. Yeah. Mm. And uh, uh, and. Uh, so they are not doing it only as just as a family. They are promoting a whole network and a collaborative effort okay. uh, through CAPSI and through uh, which uh, through us, the Advanced Business School, because of the of CAPSI and Professor Begemoy in particular. And this collaboration that you also see here. Uh, I mean, even at this conference, the Wi-Fi that we have here is it's funded yeah. by, by Strauss Business. Uh, uh, and been a panelist here was talking about the AI and how we can, as the, as the philanthropic organizations, should be should be coordinating uh, to really use AI for the benefit of the continent. So they they are doing it in a broader sense. Mm. We can. What you're saying maybe is, can we not get Strive, Dangote, Tony Emelo, uh, yeah, uh, the Patrice big names, Monsipe, yeah. Forming kind of a, 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 a collaborative uh, network that would be uh, almost like you see between Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, you know? Absolutely. You know, where Warren said, look, I don't have to set up my foundation. Bill, you've already got it. I just put money into yours. Mm. That collaboration is what we need to encourage. And I think this, they will be open to that. Okay. We need to... Uh, could, could you define the concept for us? How, how would it look like in your world? Because you're a dreamer, you're an optimist. <laughs> yeah, Let's yeah. see it. This is the platform in which yeah, we can yeah. we can articulate it. We, we we can form a platform of saying uh, African philanthropists. Maybe we should start with a, a big conference uh, of saying bring all of them one together and mm. uh, the the big names and uh, uh, and then form a platform where they can pull their financial resources uh, together for maximum impact. So we can get, get clever, smart uh, financial uh, uh, people who will create a platform in which they can all put their money together and then it be kept into some kind of a fund. Uh, we can create a fund and that fund uh, uh, then obviously they can influence it through their passion. You must remember when some people give also give based on their higher purpose in life. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, That's you true. give based on your higher purpose. Uh, and, and, and for instance, my passion, I give, I give a lot, uh, but I give in the area where I'm passionate about, in mm. leadership development. I've got a foundation called Unleashing Leadership Potential, which is a well foundation done. based in South Africa. Um, you can Google it. But because I see leadership that it matters, you know, I, mm. you know it makes or break marriage, makes or break churches, makes or break uh, uh, organizations, makes or break communities, makes or break uh, uh, countries. So my passion is developing the next generation of leaders. So we can say, well, Strive, you're passionate about technology, Patricia passionate about sport, uh, Dangote about uh, uh, industrializing Africa. Let's pull all these resources together 
both in terms of intellectual capital as, also, as well as, as, as just financial capital. And then we then together, they become patrons of this, mm. uh, uh, of this initiative uh, or platform. And then we basically take those resources and then leverage them. Absolutely. By, by, by either getting matching grants or even uh, uh, creating some kind of a, an investment fund which you can then leverage with the, with the loan uh, from the banks and then create a massive, massive, uh, almost a sovereign wealth fund for Africa. If you, if absolutely, you absolutely. Know, a sovereign yeah, yeah. wealth fund, but which is driven by uh, private sector because I'm very skeptical <laughs> about sovereign wealth fund uh, uh, driven by government by, alone. By public, yeah. <laughs> uh, government, alone. government, yeah, yeah. Maybe it would true. be in a partnership. And then we say, okay, we've got this Africa sovereign wealth fund, which mm. has been created by a black philanthropist. Uh, an African philanthropist, and then we look at the continent as a whole, and we just and the continuum yes. as you spoke yeah. quite early on, uh, how it starts and how it ends. Yeah, that's fantastic. And also, more importantly, it's the legacy then it creates for the future. Yeah, because I think what is clear is we're going to get a lot more billionaires coming out of Africa in the next you know uh, fifty hundred years. Yeah, uh, and if you look at the Western society, how they how they have done it, especially in America, is these things were done with the Rockefellers. Yeah, That's 200 years, years yeah. ago, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so if you think about it, what they were doing is they were setting the platform in which the future could learn from. Absolutely. So that's why it's very necessary for all our billionaires in Africa to set their agenda, which is pan-African, which is Ubuntu-driven, yeah. and then make it possible for the future billionaires to then just follow through. Exactly. Create it. You know, somebody say children are, are, are great imitators. Just give them something great to imitate. You I know? like that. <laughs> <laughs> so they say the next generation is great imitators. And yeah. they, we just need to give them something great to imitate, which is yeah. a legacy of uh, philanthropy, legacy of giving, legacy of selflessness, legacy of sacrifice, legacy of, 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 of compassion for the poor. Wow. This is just phenomenal, right? I, I mean, I could sit here and just listen to you and um, you've got powerful words. And I suppose that's the reason why you're in education. Yeah, let's, talk a, let's talk a little bit of that because you looked at uh, leadership development as something that you're passionate about and that you're giving towards. Please speak to us about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, again, I always talk about paying forward rather than paying backwards. Mm. The, the problem with, uh, with uh, uh, philanthropy of, uh, of the Global North is paying, paying backwards. I started leadership development as soon as I finished my, my study, I, I, I realized that leadership matters. And I started running a little bit of workshop in the youth clubs and making sure that we start local youth club. We started mm. a very youth club in our township called Katlehon, which is the eastern side of Johannesburg. Yeah. And, uh, and, the, and it grew in, uh, into impacting a lot of young people, exposing them about just basic stuff, you know, time management, setting goals and making sure that you've got a direction in life, choosing your career, choosing your, uh, and then a sense of what is your value system, what is your matrix of values that you have that will hold you as an anchor, and then making sure that you develop a certain focus area that develops your skill. Mm. And then right now, most of them are really now. So I'm very pleased now. Some of them are CEOs of companies. Oh, wow. Some of them are, are general managers. Some of them are leaders of NGOs. But just by helping them, also saving them from the destruction of the bad influences in growing up in a township, you know, mm. of drugs, of, uh, um, you know, messing around with... Uh, uh, Women, if, especially most small <laughs> boys in particular, yeah. and, uh, and 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 then gangsterism, just take them out of the of that, and and then it grew, and then down now it's actually very well established what we do. Uh, I I I mentor now young entrepreneurs, young professionals, but I realize that if I'm the only one who's talking to them, then I'll be creating a lot of Maurice's <laughs> minimies. Yeah, and I don't, <laughs> so we've opened it up. So to all the baby boomers uh, who are in South Africa whom you're talking about now, the yeah. super courses of this world, the, who started at Zaros, uh, the uh, sure. two we now invite them to this to this forum, which meets once a month. Um, 
we we have we bought a, 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 a property because I used to do it at home, and then mm. these young people started getting too many at home and uh, started opening up the fridge and uh, started going <laughs> emptying up emptying everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and my wife said, "No, no, you better find it. <laughs> like, see, this is my private home." Yeah. yeah. So we've got a, a, a kind of leadership training center that we've created, and we we meet now. We're running women in leadership, um, governance. Uh, we're running also the what I really like, the one I like. Uh, we call it YLP Authors Forum, mm. where we actually asking everyone to write a, their story. So it's oh, wow. authorship, and uh, so we've seen a lot of other what uh, authors uh, writing their story, and then we interview them. We help them write the stories of Africa because my biggest fear is that what we have gained now, we must not lose it, and we're going to lose is it. True. That is true. I'm talking about intellectual property uh, uh, that we've we've gained. We need to record it because our culture in Africa has always been oral, you know. That's and true. then uh, uh, we we've lost a lot. I mean, we've got Mapungubwe mm. in South Africa, where the cradle of mankind, where the that story that civilization was actually there. It's true. And uh, but it's not recorded. But civilization in the uh, global north, because they could they wrote. It's, it's documented. It's documented. Yeah, yeah. So we've got a very good uh, program there called uh, ULP Authors Forum, and we're encouraging people to write their stories. And then we interview them, we give them write, write, writing skills, um, and, and we run uh, every day. It's got a, every girl has got a dream, which is focusing on uh, young primary school girls to really say, You've got a dream, you know, and, uh, and, and, and it's called Every Girl's Got a Dream and help them grow up and, uh, mm. and i'm very very uh, that's for me it's my philanthropy you wow. know uh, it's to, if you uh, come come back on this analogy of a fish and yeah. my space is teaching you how to fish <laughs> well, that's a good way to end this and you know thank you so much uh, Prof. Yeah, yeah. uh maybe just one last uh, word uh, suppose you were to redo this all over again and uh you were in your 20s what would you do differently yeah, what I would do differently, first of all, I have got no regrets. Yeah, I think yeah, life good is... good to put that out there. Yeah, let's put that out there. <laughs> I don't regret my life has been uh, really been, uh, I must say, blessed mm -hmm. uh, in that way. But what I would do differently is probably make sure that I focus much more earlier to those young people as again I'm we're talking about leadership mm -hmm. I've, I've I focus on leadership on the people who are postgraduate and now I would like to start alien almost at the primary schools and and develop this leadership and entrepreneurial mindset much more earlier because right now we get into this leadership and entrepreneurial mindset later on in life and uh, if I were to do this all over again, I would really focus, which I'm doing now, okay. focusing on developing entrepreneurial mindsets of our African people earlier and leadership earlier. Because I believe all of us can be Mandela's. Mm. And we don't need to be this iconic, uh, 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 all of us. We cannot be all iconic, but we can be Mandela's in our own spheres. spheres. Mm. And that is what I can, I can really forward to do it again. I'm going to do it uh, in that way, much more earlier, focus on young people, much more earlier, give them leadership skills and tell them you can make this world a little bit better than you found it. Wow. And that is your mission and help people find their purpose earlier in life. Because mm. people who find their purpose in life uh, earlier have gone to do great things. Mm. And that's what I could uh, do if I had to. Well, thank you very much for that advice. And yeah. uh, enjoy the falls and enjoy your time here. Thank you this very much. This has been incredible uh, so far. Uh, yeah. And I'm thoroughly enjoying this. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you. You're doing a great job. Uh, thank you so Stay much. Stay safe. Stay healthy. <laughs> we'll